imagine the best meal you've ever eaten. Think about the tastes, the smells, the texture. I imagine some of you are thinking about meals that remind you of your childhood or your ethnic origin. And others may be thinking about a meal that was spectacularly tasteful. And still others may be thinking about a meal where it was actually the level of your hunger that made it spectacular, not what you ate. There are so many ways that food can conjure up happy memories for us. Now, one connection I have in my own personal life to food is that I really like to cook. And I find that cooking opens up my、uh, creativity and turns loose my creative juices in a very effective way of being able to explore different kinds of flavors and think about combining crazy combinations of foods. And when I'm successful, it makes people really happy. So I, I really love the, the diverse options we have when we think about cooking and creativity that it allows. But I have another connection to food, and that is I'm an environmental scientist. And this connection unfortunately constrains my options with food. Because the choices we make in terms of the food we eat and the way we produce it have big environmental impacts. And I'm exposed to these in a very deep way in my own work and in the work of、uh, my colleagues. And this has、uh, influenced my own personal choices from the standpoint of the types of foods that I consume and the types of foods that I cook. Well, these constraints are unfortunately going to get worse in a dramatic way over the coming decades as we project that global demand for animal protein is going to go up a lot. And it's going to go up for two reasons. One is that there are going to be a few billion more people on the planet, mostly in Africa, and that's the predictable part of this. The other is that as people in the developing world get wealthier, their diets tend to change in a pretty dramatic way to include a much higher fraction of animal protein in the diet. And this effect over the coming decades actually turns out to be a bigger impact than the increase in the number of people. But if we put these two factors together, there are a variety of projections that have suggested that we might see a doubling of global demand for animal protein by the middle of this century, relative to where we were just a few years ago. Now, what would it actually mean to produce twice as much animal protein to meet this demand? Well, I went to a talk by one of my colleagues, Dave Tillman. Um, at the University of California at Santa Barbara about four years ago, where he analyzed what the consequences would be of producing this many more cows and sheep and goats and pigs and chicken. And the basic answer was it is an enormous environmental impact. And they explored a whole variety of creative ways that you could potentially reduce these impacts. But even with their best case scenario, the impacts were really large. Here's a couple just examples. An enormous amount of land needs to be converted into food production. So, this, they estimate a couple of billion hectares. Now, to put that into context, that's equivalent to about two billion football fields being converted from natural habitats into food production. Also, big impacts when we think about greenhouse gas emissions. They projected a few additional gigatons of greenhouse gases. Now, a gigaton is a billion tons. And that's a hard thing for, I think, any of us to relate to. But just to put this in the context of what that means in terms of the mass of those gases going into the atmosphere, that'd be equivalent to about 450 million African elephants or 20 million blue whales of greenhouse gases being added to the atmosphere every year. So these are enormous impacts. And after I sat through this talk, it was, it was very sobering, obviously. These are really big challenges. That we face on the planet to meet、uh, a, a projected growth in demand、uh, in ways that、um, keep people healthy but also keep the planet healthy. And I think one of the most sobering aspects was I didn't hear any solution that was hopeful. So I went home that night and I was sitting down at dinner, and my inner marine biologist was looking down at the fish on my plate, and I thought, 
you know, we need to be looking elsewhere for effective solutions to this problem. And it struck me that most of the analyses that have been going on at this time about how we could actually meet this demand were ignoring the ocean. Why? Why wasn't the sea part of the search for a solution to this problem? And I think the reason is, is because we already have lots of evidence that there are environmental challenges that are compromising the productivity of our oceans today. And so the prospect of thinking about how these could be producing that much more was challenging to a lot of people. But I work in many ways on fixing fisheries and making them more sustainable. And I know that um, even though we have uh, compromised uh, overfishing uh, around the world, particularly in the parts of the world where this growth in demand is going to be the greatest, uh, our work has shown, and a number of others have shown, that if you fix some of these fisheries, you can in the long run actually catch more fish. And so we asked the question of, could the untapped bounty from the sea actually provide a much more planet-friendly way for us to go forward in terms of meeting this demand? So a group of my colleagues at UC Santa Barbara compiled the most uh, comprehensive analysis of the global status of the world's fisheries to try to say, what's the potential upside from fixing the world's fisheries? And what we found is that there's an enormous upside for the ocean, that if you fixed all the world's fisheries, we estimated you would have about 50% more fish in the sea after fixing that problem. And at the same time, we estimated you'd be able to catch somewhere between 10 and 20 million metric tons of more fish sustainably each year. Now, that's a lot of fish and a lot of food. But how does it compare to this challenge we face in terms of this projected really large growth in demand? Well, unfortunately, it amounts to less than 5% of what that projected growth in demand is. It's a small contribution, although it's the most important, I think, environmental contribution we could make, because this is a source of food that actually has pure environmental benefits. There are no added costs of fixing the fisheries. It's all net environmental benefits. But even if we could fix every fishery on the planet, we still have a long way to go for the oceans to be a significant contributor to this problem. So that meant we started to focus on a different way that the oceans can contribute food, and that's aquaculture, farming of the sea. Now, aquaculture in the last few years has actually surpassed the productive capacity of all the world's wild fisheries combined. And today, we can produce several hundred different species um, in aquaculture by farming them in the sea. But despite that, to tell you the truth, I'd really never really paid much attention at all to aquaculture. And part of it was because most of the story about aquaculture that I had been exposed to was really focusing on its negative impacts, the fact that it commonly is associated with land conversion, such as cutting down mangrove forests, or it can cause entanglement with uh, wild species, or it can lead to the escape of farmed animals, that it can interact in ecosystems, or it can lead to spread of disease. There's a number of different kinds of problems. And these have really, I think, dominated the discussion when we think about aquaculture as a source of food for the planet. And yet, when I put it in this context of what role this could play in terms of compared to alternative sources of food, you know, it's pretty clear that all of these forms of impacts are shared by all forms of food production. And so if we're really going to answer this question of what's the most planet-friendly way that we can move forward in terms of producing food, we have to evaluate these impacts in a level playing field. How do they compare to other ways that we could potentially produce a similar amount of food? So we pulled together this kind of a global analysis for looking at all the forms of meat production we can think of, and looked at a whole variety of different environmental impacts, how much air you have to convert into food production, the amount of greenhouse gases that get added to the atmosphere, fresh water use, nutrient pollution, and a variety of other metrics. And so I'm going to simplify the results to you here with just some simple pictures by showing you a few animals where the size of the animal is going to be representative of the average level of environmental impact per pound of protein. So for the same amount of food, what's the overall impact? Okay. So the standard bearer in terms of largest impact is cows. 
And second is goats and sheep. Now, I'm not going to show you every animal on the planet, so don't worry about it. Um, I'm just going to show you a few. Um, next, chickens in this realm. If we go from there, farmed fish. And you may not even be able to see this, but farmed shellfish at the bottom. So the results that come out of this show that, one, there's enormous variability among different forms of food in terms of their impacts across these wide variety of different metrics. And the other striking thing that caught me by surprise before, after we did this analysis was despite the perception of aquaculture as being this really big problem from an environmental standpoint, it was dramatically better than options on land. And in fact, if we look at shellfish, in every single one of those environmental metrics, it's at least an order of magnitude lower impact per pound of protein than options on land. So these are really big differences. But what do they mean in the context of this problem of the amount of food that we need to produce to be able to meet this projected growth in demand? So let's do a thought experiment. Let's imagine that we try to produce the uh, total amount of projected demand with one thing, say chickens or fish or cows. Now, of course, that's not the way it would ever happen. The world's not just going to eat one thing. But what this allows us to do is kind of bound the possibilities. We can look at what's the worst case option, what's the best case option, and this allows us to kind of see uh, what's the range of possibilities, but also what's the range of options in terms of shifting diets, say, today, into some other options, how much potential benefit can we get from that? So I'm just going to show you three of the results that come out of this. And let's start with the amount of land area or water area you would have to convert into food production to be able to produce this much protein. The worst option in all these is going to be on the left, and it's, in this case, it's sheep and goats followed very closely by cows. If you're going to produce that much food in terms of what we project is the demand by 2050, you would have to convert an area about the size of three-fourths of South America into new food production. That's a lot of land conversion from natural habitats. By contrast, at the other extreme, we have shellfish. You could produce the same total amount of animal protein in an area that's smaller than the shallow continental shelf around the islands of New Zealand. Now, if your geography is a little bit rusty, that's a lot smaller area. <laughs> Second impact, greenhouse gases. Worst case scenario here is cows. If we were to produce this total demand by beef, it would be the equivalent of adding about three-fourths of China's total greenhouse gas emissions as a new source of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, or more than the entire greenhouse gas emissions of the US. By contrast, if we do this with shellfish, same amount of protein being produced, you, the greenhouse gas emissions would be equivalent to about a Texas and a half. Now, if anybody's listening is from Texas, you probably don't like the fact that I'm using it as an example of something that's small, but this is <laughs> dramatically smaller than the options on the left. Finally, fresh water. We're, again, the worst option is cows. Producing this much additional beef would require a volume of water roughly equivalent to one of the Great Lakes in terms of new water available for food production. Where is that going to come from? By contrast, you could produce the same amount of animal protein with shellfish with essentially no water at all. So as you can see, the differences between the poles of options that we have are enormous. And remember back to that picture of animal sizes. For every single one of these, the aquaculture end tends to be way on the lower end. In this case, the extreme case is always shellfish, but farm fish is also quite good in many of these kinds of metrics. So I think the general conclusion that comes out of this is from the standpoint of planetary health, surf is dramatically better than turf if we are going to try to meet this projected growth in demand. And there's some relatively straightforward reasons as to why it's so much better. Um, one is that on land, we tend to eat warm-blooded animals, whereas from the sea, we mostly eat cold-blooded animals. And as a consequence, on land, animals can't produce as much meat 
per unit of energy they take in because they have to devote energy to producing heat. Similarly, on land, animals have to deal with gravity, which means they have to invest a lot more in a robust skeleton, which compromises their efficiency in producing meat. Third, in the sea, we can use the three-dimensional uh, aspect of the environment in a much more effective way to grow food by taking advantage of the depth of the water column and the buoyancy that water provides. It allows us to grow food in a spatially efficient way that is dramatically better than any option on land. And then fourth, if we're growing animals in the sea, we don't have to feed them fresh water. So the fresh water needs for aquaculture only come from the needs that we, it takes to produce the food. So for a whole variety of metrics, there are good reasons to, as to why we'd expect that food from the sea has the potential of being much, much lower impact across a range of different kinds of environmental metrics in terms of meeting this demand. So given that those benefits and the fact that anything that moves us to, in the future, to more of a diet shift to food from the sea, how do we get there? What are the kinds of changes that would actually motivate those kinds of shifts? Well, on the one hand, I think that evidence will play a role for some people in the sense of these kinds of analyses that allow us to see what are the differential consequences in terms of planetary health will motivate some behavior change. And I suspect that'll be true for some of the people that listen to this talk. That being said, I think even overwhelming evidence of planetary benefits of some forms of food choices versus others is probably not going to motivate enough change globally to really be able to address this problem in a way that has uh, large global benefits. But fortunately, I think there are two other ways that we may be able to influence this. One is the fact that some of these costs are influenced in prices, uh, so land and water. The other, and, the, and if we in incorporate things like carbon taxes, there would be differential effects. The other, and I think the most important aspect, is that evidence suggests in medical literature that there's a big benefit of shifting towards a pescatarian diet in terms of human health. So human health and planetary health tend to be aligned. And that means that I think there's going to be much more motivation for people to vote in their own self-interest and, and vote on the human health side, but the planet still benefits. So what can you do? Well, next time you're in a restaurant, consider the ripple effects of your choices, and in particular, the positive ripple effects of moving more to the sea. Choose wisely in your choice of food. It really matters. Thank you. Thank you.